OK, this week uh, is very surprising. I did not expect to see you guys in class today. Uh, but since everyone is supposed to be here. First of all, uh, everyone in the room, if you have not yet grabbed a copy of Paradise Lost, I have a few more copies left. Um, and if you don't grab one today, I will throw them in the trash. So today um, we're going to be finishing our discussion of Paradise Lost. Uh, this week's reading is from the second half of book nine, uh, starting from right after Eve eats the forbidden fruit uh, all the way to the end of the poem. Uh, so I will lead you guys in discussing this week's five questions. Uh, and after that, I will introduce the next unit on Jane Austen's persuasion. I have, in fact, prepared a tall pile of new handouts. Uh, so if you are in the room today, you are very lucky. You get to grab uh, the first half of the novel and take that home with you. After introducing the next unit, I will explain the midterm exam. Uh, and then if we have time left, I will let you get started on thinking about the exam. So let's jump into Paradise Lost. Question one, what's the first sign that you noticed of Eve's change after she eats the forbidden fruit? Uh, after line 794. So let's take a look at that. If I can find it, hang on. Uh, OK, so if you're following along at home with a paper copy, this is on page. 1990. Yeah, page 1990. Uh, line 794. Uh, she OK, let's actually let's start from right after she takes a bite. So line 781. Forth reaching to the fruit she plucked, she eat. So she ate the fruit. Earth felt the wound, and nature from her seat, sighing through all her works, gave signs of woe that all was lost. So the very first thing that happens after she eats the forbidden fruit is that earth and nature are wounded. Remember, uh, Earth and nature and everything else was created by God. So when God's best creation, humans, disobey him, all of his other creations also feel pain. OK, now let's jump down to line 794. Thus to herself she pleasingly began. So now she's giving a speech right after uh, she has eaten the fruit. Oh, sovereign, virtuous, precious of all trees in paradise. So she's talking to the tree. Uh, this is remember, this is how Satan began his speech to Eve, right? He also began by praising the tree. So we see in Eve's response, now that she has eaten the forbidden fruit, she is also starting to think and act like Satan. It showed the the mirroring, the reflection shows that she has been Influenced, she has been corrupted. Uh, so she praises the tree. Uh, and then she says that she uh, near line 800. Line 799. But henceforth, which means from now on, my early care not without song each morning and due praise shall tend thee. So now every morning I will praise you with song. 
So usually, like religious people, the first thing they do when they wake up, they praise God. But here she says that she will now praise the tree. And the fertile burden, ease of thy full branches offered free to all. So every morning she will keep eating the fruit. She will ease the burden of the branches. Uh, the branches are like weighed down with fruit and she will help the branches by relieving them of the weight of the fruit. So she's going to eat the fruit. Till dieted by thee, I grow mature in knowledge as the gods who all things know. So she says she will keep eating until she understands everything like the gods do. Again, in this world, there should only be one God. So when she talks about gods, many gods, it's also a sign that she is starting to go astray from the true faith. Uh, okay, so after she praises the tree and says that she's going to keep eating, then she starts thinking about practical, uh, her practical situation. So let's jump to line 811. And I perhaps am secret, which means hidden. Heaven is high, high and remote to see from thence distinct each thing on earth. In Chinese, basically, this is Tian Gao Huang Di Ren. And other care, care means concerns, perhaps may have diverted from continual watch our great forbidder, safe with all his spies about him. So she's saying, maybe God doesn't know. Heaven is far away. He has many things to think about. Uh, so maybe he has not yet noticed. So like already she's trying to comfort herself. She's trying to rationalize Hua, her situation. But to Adam, in what sort shall I appear? So, okay, she's first thought about God. Now she's thinking about Adam. What should I do with Adam? How should I deal with him? Shall I to him make known as yet my change? Should I, should I tell him what I did? And give him to partake full happiness with me? Should I share this forbidden fruit with Adam? Or rather not but keep the odds of knowledge in my power without co-partner. Here, odds means advantage. So should I share the forbidden fruit and its knowledge with Adam, or should I keep it for myself so that I can gain an advantage over him? So again, now that she has eaten the forbidden fruit, she's starting to think about these uh, lower affairs, right? Uh, how do I escape blame from God? Should I treat Adam as an equal or should I keep him in my power? These are obviously ignoble thoughts. These are ideas that are not worthy of God's greatest creation. Why would she not share with him? Continuing on uh, line 821. So to add what wants in female sex, the more to draw his love, and render me more equal. And perhaps a thing not undesirable, sometimes superior. So why is she considering the idea of advantage over Adam? Because uh, in the story of the Bible, women are created from man and so are inferior to man. They are not his, they are second place behind men. So she's saying, uh, if I use this knowledge to gain an advantage over him, maybe he will love me more and make me more equal. In fact, may even make me superior, more powerful. And then on 825, she says, for inferior, who is free? And the footnote tells us this is exactly what Satan said at near the beginning of the poem, which is, how 
how can we be free if we must obey God? So even something that uh, Satan did not tell Eve, now she's thinking like him. This may be well, but, so on the other hand, what if God have seen and death ensue? So what if God did see? What if God, uh, I will die? Then I shall be no more. And Adam wedded to another Eve shall live with her enjoying I extinct. A death to think. So on the other hand, if I do die, Adam might have a new woman. And she can't bear thinking about this. So that's another new emotion. Jealousy. Confirmed then I resolve Adam shall share with me in bliss or woe. So she decides she will share the forbidden fruit with him. So dear I love him that with him all deaths I could endure without him live no life. So saying, so after she finished saying this, from the tree her step she turned. So she steps away from the tree, turns around, but first low reverence done, she bows to the tree. As to the power that dwelt within, whose presence had infused into the plant cyanthal sap, derived from nectar, drink of, of gods. So it, th the poem here tells us she's not worshipping the tree. She's worshipping the power that made the fruit of this tree. The power that gave her knowledge of good and evil. We, of course, remember that this power came from God, but she forgets about God in this moment, and she worships the power of the tree. So going back to the question, what is the first sign you noticed of Eve's change? Uh, we just witnessed her first trying to avoid responsibility, then thinking about whether she wants to uh, use her knowledge against Adam. Then we saw her express jealousy. And finally, we saw her worshiping a tree instead of God. All of this immediately after she eats the fruit. So, you know, Milton wrote 12,000 lines of this poem, but he wasted no time in telling us exactly what is good and what is bad. Let's move on to the next question. Do you agree with Adam's reason for eating the forbidden fruit? Why or why not? So we know that uh, not just Eve, but also Adam eats the fruit. But why? At this moment, only Eve has succumbed to the seducements of this fruit and of Satan's speeches. So why does Adam join her? Line 906. This is on the next page. 1992. So uh, Eve goes back to Adam, tells him what she has done, uh, gives him the fruit, asks, her, uh, asks him to eat it also. So first he scolds her, right? How could you do this? Then starting on line 906, and me with thee hath ruined. So you've already ruined me as well. For with thee certain my resolution is to die. How can I live without thee? How forego thy sweet converse, which means conversation, and love so dearly joined to live again in these wild woods forlorn? So basically he's saying, you have doomed me also because I can't live without you. So I must join you. 9-11, should God create another Eve and I another rib afford. Rib is logu. Uh, remember, Eve was created when God took a rib from Adam and turned it into Eve. So even if uh, the sentence beginning should is uh, subjunctive, jasaruchi. So even if God created another Eve and I gave another rib, yet loss of thee would never from my heart. I would never be able to get over you. 
No, no, I feel the link of nature draw me. Flesh of flesh, bone of my bone thou art, and from thy state mine never shall be parted bliss or woe. So he's saying, because you are created from my body, I can still feel that connection, whether it is like uh, love for her or a physical connection with Eve. Wherever she goes, he feels like he has to follow. Next page. Uh, so having said, as one from sad dismay recomforted and after thoughts disturbed, submitting to what seemed to remedy this, thus in calm mood, his words to Eve, he turned. So now that he has uh, figured out what's going on and has decided what he's going to do, then he talks to Eve. Bold deed thou hast presumed, adventurous Eve. Zhen basically. And peril great provoked. Peril means danger. Who thus has dared, had it been only co uh, coveting to eye that sacred fruit. So even if you had only wanted to eat and did not actually eat, that would already be dangerous enough. Sacred to abstinence. Much more to taste it under ban to touch. So you not only wanted to eat it, you actually ate it. Very risky, very dangerous of you. So, you know, that, that is the scolding part. But then he says, but past, who can recall or done undo? Uh, in other words, not God omnipotent nor fate. So nobody, not even God, can change what has already happened. Yet so perhaps thou shalt not die. Perhaps the fact is not so heinous now for tasted fruit profaned first by the serpent, by him first made common and unhallowed ere our taste. So he's saying very something very similar to what Eve said, but for a different reason. Perhaps you will not die, but not as Eve said, because God didn't notice. He, uh, Adam's reason is maybe eating the forbidden fruit is not such a bad crime since the snake, Satan, ate it first and therefore made it possible to eat the fruit, made the fruit less uh, sacred, less forbidden. But of course, uh, we know Satan didn't actually eat the fruit. He was lying about that. Continuing, nor yet on him found deadly, he yet lives, right? So Adam, Eve told Adam what Satan told her. And so Adam is now thinking, actually, yeah, that kind of does make sense, right? He did eat the fruit. He's still alive. Maybe we will not die either. So both of them have been fooled by Satan's lies. Uh, lives as thou said, right? As you said to me, he's still alive, and gains to live as man higher degree of life, inducement strong to us as likely tasting to attain proportional ascent, which cannot be, uh, but uh, which cannot be, but to be gods or angels, demigods. So Adam is now completely swallowing everything that Satan told Eve. He says he ate the fruit, he didn't die. He gained more knowledge, became able to talk. Therefore, if Eve eats the fruit, she will not die. She will, in fact, become an angel or even almost a god. So Adam is believing everything that he told her. But then he adds his own reason. Nor can I think that God, creator wise, though threatening, will in earnest so destroy us his prime creatures, dignified so high, set over all his works. So he's saying, even though God gave us the order, even though God said he would give us death, maybe he won't go through with it. After all, we are his prime creatures. We are his best creations. And we are put over all of nature, right? All of nature is given us to uh, look over, to supervise, I guess, to manage. 
which in our fall for us created needs with us must fail dependent made. So if God gave all of his creation to us to manage and if we die, doesn't that mean all of his creations will also fail? So maybe God won't punish us. Uh, continuing, so God shall uncreate, be frustrate, do, undo, and labor lose, not well conceived of God, who though his power creation could repeat, yet would be loath us to abolish, lest the adversary triumph and say, fickle their state whom God most favors, who can please him long. So now he's saying, it's true, God could simply redo everything he just did. But first of all, like that would be a waste of God's efforts. Secondly, if God did do this, then Satan would be able to laugh at God and say, ha ha, look, your best creation disobeyed you and you were forced to kill them. Who will follow you now? So Adam is also kind of trying to rationalize his way out of this situation. For all of these reasons, maybe God will decide not to punish us. But regardless of all of these reasons, he then moves on to the key reason, line 952. However, I with thee have fixed my lot. My lot means my destiny. My destiny has been attached to your destiny. Certain to undergo like doom. So we will undergo the same fate. If death consort with thee, death is to me as life. So if, if death will come to you, then my life is also death. We will stick together. F so forcible within my heart, I feel the bond of nature draw me to my own, my own in thee. For what thou art is mine, our state cannot be severed. We are one, one flesh. To lose thee were to lose myself. So he's also again saying uh, we came from the same body. We came from the same material. So whatever happens to you will happen to me. And then he eats the fruit. So I, I don't know how you previously imagined this story, whether Eve tricked Adam into eating the fruit or whether he, she just gave him the fruit and didn't tell him where she got it. But in Paradise Lost, Adam makes a conscious knowing choice to join Eve in disobeying God. And his basic reason is because Eve is from my body, we are forever connected. I cannot keep living without her. Does that make sense? Do you agree? On the one hand, we today, uh, whenever we have a friend who's heartbroken, we will always at some point tell them, don't be too sad or, you know, there are other people out there. You will find your one true love. But in Paradise Lost, Eve was at the time the only woman. They were the first humans. Nobody had ever been through heartbreak before. So we can better understand why Adam would feel like it is the end of the world and it is worth basically sacrificing himself in order to keep following Eve. He only can imagine what it might be like to have a second Eve. He doesn't know. There's no experience. There's no precedent. Um, if he's already wavering on the line between following and not following God, how much faith could he have that God will be able to make him happy again? So it does make a kind of sense. Um, we don't have to think about it like they came from the same body. We just we we instead can simply think about it as they are the only two humans. Uh, the idea that they came from the same body is basically the idea that their source is known. Like today, if you meet somebody and you fall in love with them, then you find out about their family history and you talk about your pasts. 
that kind of thing. But in Paradise Lost, they already know all of that background. Their source is known, their origin is known. That's I, what that's what I think uh, being from the same body means. Let's move on to question three. How are the inner states of Adam and Eve changed after eating the forbidden fruit? What about their behavior? Can you give some examples? And I, in fact, already put up where the examples are. So we already saw Eve change after uh, eating the forbidden fruit. What about Adam? Let's take a look at this. Line 1008. This is on page 1994. So he ate the forbidden fruit. He and Eve ate a lot of the forbidden fruit. It's not just one bite. They had a lot of it. And then on line 1008, as with new wine intoxicated both, they swim in mirth. Mirth means joy and happiness. And fancy, which means imagine, that they feel divinity within them, breeding wings wherewith to scorn the earth. So they feel like they are becoming gods. That the, the idea of godhood, the power of gods, is opening up inside them so that, in fact, they could even leave the earth. But that false fruit, far other operation first displayed. So the fruit is actually doing something else inside them. Carnal desire inflaming. Uh, the fruit sparked sexual desire for the first time. Now, there is a long tradition of debate about uh, whether or how Adam and Eve would have created children if they did not eat of this fruit, right? Because we know humans have to have sex in order to give birth to the next generation. But the poem says they only now feel sexual desire. So like, what was the original plan? Uh, and I, the conclusion of the debate is basically that before eating the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve treated sex like any other behavior or game or activity. There's nothing special about sex. There's nothing especially powerful about sex. It was just something that they would do. But after eating the fruit, then they start to feel sexual desire, the, the power of being attracted to the physical body and presence of the other person. Uh, in psychoanalysis, Jing Zhen Fen Xi, Sexual desire, desire of any kind, is defined as a lack, trifa. It's powered by wanting something. But because it is a lack and not the thing that you lack, once you obtain what you want, your desire will simply shift to something else or someone else. And so the idea of desire in this sense as a lack is a new kind of logic that previously did not exist in the Garden of Eden, in Paradise Lost. In the Garden of Eden, whatever humans wanted, God would give them. And that's it. End of story. People are happy. But with sexual desire, suddenly there is this new idea that people will always want something, not any particular thing, just that they will feel like they want something. So they feel sexual desire. Uh, I'm going to skip the next few lines, but basically they look at each other very sexily and then they have sex for the rest of the day. Um, and then I'm skipping a, a lot, right? They had sex for a long time. OK, uh, let's jump to line 1064. So they wake up uh, and they have lost all their virtue. Silent. 
and in face confounded long they sat. So they sat with a confused look on their face. As struck and mute, Ingya, they, they don't know what to say. Till Adam, though not less than Eve abashed, abashed here means ashamed, so both feel ashamed, but Adam at length gave utterance to these words constrained. Uh, he's the one to break the silence. Guess what he does? O oh, Eve, in evil hour thou didst give ear to that false worm of whomsoever taught to counterfeit man's voice, true in our fall, false in our promised rising. He blames Eve for everything. Why did you listen to that false serpent? Uh, who gave us false promises of becoming gods. False in our promised rising. Since our eyes opened, we find indeed and find we know both good and evil. Good lost and evil got. So in a sense, Satan was only half lying. When he said that you will understand good and evil, he was telling the truth. What he did not say is that once you eat the fruit, not only will you understand good and evil, you will lose the good and gain the evil. Uh, and then he complains about their situation. And then he says on line 1080, how shall I behold the face henceforth of God or angel? Earth with joy and rapture so oft beheld. So now that we have sinned, how can I look at God? How can I look at the angels? Those heavenly shapes will dazzle now this earthly with their blaze insufferably bright. So now that Adam and Eve have fallen, they are now of the earth and no longer of heaven. So when God or the angels of heaven come down, they will be too bright so that Adam and Eve cannot look at them. Uh, so then he says that he would rather live alone and hide from heaven. And then after he's finished complaining, then he says, maybe we should do something. Line 1091. By the way, uh, before eating the fruit, nobody would complain about anything. Even if they had a reason to complain, they wouldn't complain. They would simply say, oh, God will take care of us or something like that. So complaining is also a new behavior. 1091, but let us now as in bad plight, plight means situation, devise what best may for the present serve to hide the parts of each from other that seem most to shame obnoxious and unseemly as seen. In other words, oh my God, we're naked. We should probably cover ourselves. So he's thinking we should like get some leaves or something and cover our middle parts. So this is also new behavior, right? They've always been naked, but they've never felt that there was something wrong with this. Only after they have gained knowledge do they feel like it is a bad thing to be naked? Only after they have experienced sexual desire do they uh, try to, or do they have to think about how to prevent sexual desire again? So they make some clothes and coverings for each other. Uh, let's jump to the next page, 1120, line 1120. Uh, not at rest or ease of mind. So they've dressed, but they, they're still worried. And they're still not peaceful in their minds. They sat them down to weep. Nor only tears rained at their eyes, but high winds worse within began to rise. So after they finished uh, putting on clothes, they sit down to cry, but not just sadness. They cry from so many new emotions inside them high winds 
uh, emotions blowing them this way and that way like the wind. High passions, anger, hate, mistrust, suspicion, discord, which means fen luan. Uh, all of these shook sore their inward state of mind, calm region once and full of peace, now tossed and turbulent. For understanding ruled not, and the will heard not her lore, both in subjection now to sensual appetite. And so the reason they are suddenly feeling so many strong emotions is because they are no longer controlled by reason, Li Xing. Understanding, which means reason, ruled not, bu zai tong zi. And the will, yi zi, uh, heard not her lore, because both are in subjection now to sensual appetite, gan guan de wei kou. So sexual desire is just the first part. Now, all of their feelings and emotions are taking control. Uh, then Adam scolds Eve again, right? When I said don't go alone, you should have stayed with me. Uh, you should have known that testing the devil will only give you a bad outcome. And then Eve turns around to blame Adam. How can you say this, Adam? You should have prevented me. You won the argument. Why did you let, let me go? So that's also a new behavior, blaming other people. Of course, we know that both of them are guilty of disobeying God, but they're both trying to shift the responsibility to the other person. Uh, hang on, there's more. Uh, let's see. And then, like after they finished arguing and they get tired and they sleep, later on, an angel comes to ask them, why are you dressed in clothes? What's going on? What happened? Uh, this is on page 2001. And Adam replies like this. Oh, heaven in evil strait, which means a uh, dangerous situation. This day I stand before my judge, either to undergo myself the total crime or to accuse my other self, the partner of my life. So he's saying I have two choices. I can take all of the responsibility. Or I can try to put the responsibility onto Eve. And then immediately he says, who's failing, which means her failing, while her faith to me remains, I should conceal and not expose to blame by my complaint. So we're still together. She's following, still following me. I should try to protect her. But, <laughs> but strict necessity subdues me and calamitous constraint lest on my head both sin and punishment however insupportable be all devolved so but if i don't put some of the blame on her would i be able to take and withstand and endure all of god's punishment if i get her to share my punishment would it be easier for me Though should I hold my peace, which means keep my mouth shut, yet thou wouldst easily detect what I conceal. So now that I have thought of blaming Eve, even if I don't say it, you, God, and the angels will know what I'm thinking. Therefore, at the end, he blames her. This woman, whom thou madest to be my help and gavest me as thy perfect gift, so good, so fit, so acceptable, so divine, that from her hand I could suspect no ill. And what she did, whatever in itself her doing seemed to justify the deed. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So, you know, uh, before eating the fruit, if something they had done was blamed, 
uh, they would probably just agree, oh, we screwed up. Sorry, we're not going to do it again. But here, now that he has knowledge of good and evil, which means knowledge of what he should have done and what he did not do and the consequences of doing or not doing. Now that he has knowledge of these things, he can try to manipulate them. So he's trying to blame Eve in order to, to lessen the burden on himself. But of course, God knows exactly what's going on. So he says, basically, didn't I say that you were in charge, that woman follows man, and now you're blaming her? Who is the woman and who is the man, basically? We don't have to agree with the sexism, uh, but we should recognize that this is the story. This is the world of the story. One more piece of evidence. Uh, so God places uh, a lot of the blame on Adam. And so Adam finally starts complaining directly to God. This is on page 2014. Did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mold me man? Ah. This is the same complaint that Satan had uh, of God. Satan said, uh, like, you created us and expect us, therefore, to follow you, but we didn't ask you to create us. That's what Adam is saying. I didn't ask you, or did I ask you to take clay from the earth and turn it into man? Did I solicit thee from darkness? Solicit means ask. Did I ask you from darkness to promote me? Or here place in this delicious garden? So basically he's saying, I didn't ask you to make me. I didn't ask you to give me free will. This is not my problem. It's your problem. So even Adam here is un consciously using the same logic as Satan did earlier in the poem. But he's not Satan. He's human, so there's both good and bad inside him. And so later on, he realizes that his logic is not very good here. Uh, so if we jump to line 760, 760, He's talking to himself. What if thy son prove disobedient and reproved, which means scolded, retort, which means reply, wherefore didst thou beget me? Why did you give birth to me? I sought it not. It's not what I asked for. Wouldst thou admit for his contempt of thee that proud excuse? Yet him not thy election, but natural necessity begot. So Adam realizes that his logic is faulty, uh, but it's not immediate, right? After eating the fruit of good and evil, it takes him some time to realize why he's wrong. So these are just some examples of how Adam and Eve's thinking and behavior have changed after eating the forbidden fruits. Question four, how would you explain the logic of original sin being passed down through the generations? Do you think it makes sense? Why or why not? This is the question we talked about last week. Uh, one of you guys brought up the idea that it doesn't make sense. Why should the children have to suffer for the crimes of the parents? So let's look at how the poem explains this. Book 10, line 818. So this is on page 2016. Adam is again talking to himself. Posterity, which means uh, stands cursed. Fair patrimony that I must leave ye sons. Patrimony is uh, the rights 
and privileges of fatherhood. In other words, what a father can give his children. Fair patrimony that I must leave you, sons. This is he's being ironic. We might even say he's being sarcastic. Uh, right, like look at what good things I can leave you. In other words, not very good things at all. Oh, were I able to waste it all myself and leave ye none? So like I wish I could use up all of my curse and not pass it down to you. So disinherited, how would ye bless me now your curse? So if I were able to spend my curse and not pass it down to you, you would bless me instead of curse me. Uh, sorry, he's talking to his future children. Uh, why should all mankind for one man's fault thus guiltless be condemned if guiltless? That's the question. Why should all of his children be blamed if they didn't do anything? But, but from me what can proceed but all corrupt, both mind and will depraved? Not to do only, but to will the same with me. So on the other hand, are they guiltless? How, what could they do? How could they think in any way that is not influenced by my curse? What can proceed? Like what can come from them? that is not corrupt in mind and will and action. And because of this, how can they then acquitted stand in sight of God? Therefore, they also will deserve the blame. So again, this is something that we in uh, we today have to think a bit about in order to truly understand. Uh, in the old days, things were passed down through the bloodline, Shemai. And so they also believed that blessings and curses were passed down through the bloodline. We today might call the bloodline genetics, Jing. But we don't have to think about genetics. We can think instead about culture. How do children grow? How do they learn? First of all, they learn and grow from their parents. What about their bodies? Uh, if a mother is breastfeeding, then the child will first be raised on their mother's milk. So if their body is corrupted, if the parents' bodies are corrupted, if the parents' minds are corrupted, then how could their children grow up into pure and uncorrupted human beings? Uh, this is the modern understanding of original sin. There's also a psychoanalytical understanding, which is basically now that uh, sex is impure, it's filled with sexual desire. So the act of creating children itself is no longer pure. And so every child is now born in sin. In some kind of sin. So the question is, do you think this makes sense? Uh, I'll tell you right now, this is a question on your midterm exam, so I'll leave it for you to think about. Let's take a 10 minute short break. OK, let's continue. Question five. Do you think the events of Paradise Lost, the entire poem, support its moral, the lesson that it's supposed to be telling? So let's jump to book 12, the last book. This is on page 2053. So this is Adam talking. Henceforth, so from now, I learned that to obey is best. 
and love with fear the only God. So not just love, but also fear the only God. To walk as in his presence, so to walk, to behave like he's always there, ever to observe his providence, which means to respect what he gives us. Right, providence, provide what he gives us. And on him soul depend, merciful over all his works, with good still overcoming evil, still here means always, so good will always win over evil, and by small accomplishing great things, by things deemed weak, subverting worldly strong, and worldly wise by simply meek. So in other words, uh, in the Bible, there are many places that say like the weak will, will come out on top and the poor will enter heaven, that kind of idea. That suffering for truth's sake is fortitude to highest victory. Here, truth means faith, faith in God. And to the faithful death, the gate of life. So if you have faith, death is only the entrance to true life in heaven. Taught this by his example, whom I now acknowledge my Redeemer ever blessed. So here, Redeemer, he's talking about Jesus. An angel has just come down to explain to Adam what will happen in human history and has told Adam about Jesus and how we talked about last week, Jesus will come down and turn into a, a partly into humans so that he can uh, take the blame for all of humanity and ask for God's forgiveness. So Adam has learned about this and uh, learning about this future has prompted him to say all of this. and basically to thank Jesus for saving his children in the future. Uh, so the angel then replies to Adam, this having learnt, thou hast attained the sum of wisdom. This is the highest wisdom that you could possibly learn. Hope no higher. So don't try to learn more because there's nothing beyond this. But it's also kind of scolding Adam for want, wanting to learn more by eating the forbidden fruit. So reminding him, hope no higher. Though all the stars thou knewst by name and all the ethereal powers, all secrets of the deep, deep here means the ocean. All nature's works are works of God in heaven, air, earth, or sea, and all the riches of this world enjoyest and all the rule one empire. So don't hope for more, uh, even if you learn about all of this and you achieve all of this, there is nothing higher than learning the true wisdom that Adam has just talked about. Following God, the weak will win, the poor will win, that kind of thing. Only add deeds to thy knowledge answerable. So the only thing you can do to achieve more is not only to know, right, wisdom, not only to know, but also to do in accordance with what you know. So add deeds. Deeds means actions. Add faith. Add virtue, patience, temperance. Temperance means moderation. Zongyong. Add love. By name to come called charity. Uh, so in this poem, they have been using the word love, but here the angel tells the reader that in the future, which means at the time that the reader is reading this poem, the name of love has changed to charity, which in uh, Chinese, I guess we could call it. So the idea is it's not romantic love. It's not family love. It's love for humans or strangers. That is what the angel wants Adam to add to his wisdom. Acts of charity. The soul of all the rest. So charity is the key point. Charity is the key virtue. It is the soul of all the rest. Then will thou not be loath to leave this paradise? 
if you do this, if you follow the wisdom you have learned today, and if you add all of these virtues and you behave properly, you will not be unwilling to leave paradise but shalt possess a paradise within the happier far. Because if you do all this, wherever you go, paradise will be inside you. This is also very interesting because it's kind of like what Satan said, right? Uh, hell is a state of mind. Wherever I am, I can decide that this is not hell. And here the angel is saying, if you are a good Christian, if you're a good religious person, everywhere you go will be heaven. And this reminds us that, you know, Satan used to be an angel. He used to know faith and truth and all of this stuff. So the logic may be similar, but Satan is using it for a completely opposite goal. Uh, to, to increase his own power. Whereas here the angel is telling Adam to do this to increase his faith in God and doing and believing in the right thing. So the question was, does the entire poem support this moral, support these final concluding ideas? Well, the poem has been 12,000 lines long. It's probably hard for every line to support this moral. There are some parts that uh, focus more on Satan and his thinking and his logic and his motivation. We have seen some parts that try to trick the reader, that try to get you to agree with Satan's thinking. But in the Christian religion, there is also the idea that uh, you have to understand sin and you have to experience sin in order to truly uh, find value in avoiding sin. The idea is, uh, if you are a perfect uh, creature, if you are a perfect angel, you have no idea what sin is, no idea what it feels like, no idea why people would do sins, then the fact that you are good itself does not bring you much credit. You were already perfect. You didn't have to work for it. But because humans... Uh, gained original sin, that makes their return back to God even more valuable. Uh, in the Bible, there is a part where uh, the devil tries to tempt Jesus with worldly power and with money and all of these things. Uh, and Jesus, of course, is not tempted because he is the perfect being. He ha does not understand the allure, the attraction of these things things of power of sex of money but we humans do we have original sin we come from sin and we enter into uh, faith therefore even the parts of the poem where we follow satan and we are tricked to try to agree with him could also be part of the moral if the entire poem were written about like perfect events and perfect people and everybody is happy and perfect and nice and faithful, it would be a very boring poem. It's precisely because we have the villain, the devil, precisely because it is possible to understand and even agree with what Satan is talking about. That makes the final lesson more powerful especially for the original readers who lived in a Christian society where everybody agreed with or is supposed to agree with these values. So even the parts of the poem that don't seem to be directly supporting the central idea do in fact kind of support the central idea. Uh, religion is very tricky like that. Even the parts that don't seem religious are also kind of religious. So that concludes our discussion of Paradise Lost. Do you guys have questions? Students online, do you have questions? Okay. 
next week we're watching a movie, uh, the movie version of Persuasion. And then the week after that, uh, please read the first four chapters. Let me show you what we're going to be doing in the final unit. Wait, where am I? Okay, let me show you what we're what's going to happen. Uh, the novel is called Persuasion by Jane Austen. I think there may be a simplified Chinese translation somewhere online. I'm not sure. Uh, you have the introduction, then you have the entire novel. The novel has 24 chapters and we have six weeks. So we're going to read four chapters each week. Uh, students in the classroom have already picked up the new handout. This handout covers the first half of the book, the first 12 chapters. Um, and four chapters a week may sound like a lot, but if you are in the room and you can look at the handout, you will realize it's not a lot. Uh, chapter one goes to the third page of the handout. So it looks like four chapters sounds like a lot, but it's not really. Uh, when we're reading Jane Austen, this novel was published in the 19th century, I think around 1840. Uh, so it's closer to the modern day, but there are still some differences. The biggest differences are, of course, in the world of the story. Jane Austen writes about nobles, Guizhu. So like even though we read about people and their daily life and what they do, we have to remember that these are not ordinary people. They are rich, they have land. Some of them are even connected to the royal family. And this is a big part of their society, how people should behave as nobles. Um, and in the society of that time, in the noble society of that time, the most important things were uh, connections to the royal family and connections to the royal family were often con uh, related to land and money. They don't like money for itself. They like money because it means they have land and they like land because it means that the royal family favors them and have granted them the land. So everything is connected to your distance to the royal family. And this makes sense because the closer you are to the royal family, the more power you have, the more influence you have. And if you are part of the royal family, you may even one day become king. Not really, but that's what people thought. Um, so a lot of their world is focused on these ideas. Now that's for the men. For the women uh, in that society, it was quite traditional. And so uh, the women mostly cared about what kind of husbands they had and how they could improve the power and influence of their husbands. The story of persuasion follows Anne, who is at the beginning of the story already 30 or almost 30 and does not have a husband. In a society where women were married off like between starting from like 16, 30 and single was not a good look for a woman. Uh, and when we begin reading, we realize that Anne was not always single. She once was pursued by a man, but the man at that time was poor. His only uh, possibility of gaining money and power is by joining the Navy. Uh, but because joining the Navy does not make you a noble, it could only give you money. Uh, so Anne's family uh, did not allow her to marry him. Ten years later, he comes back. But because they have not kept in contact, they don't know what's going on with the other person. So this story is not just a love story and a marriage story. It is a story about love regained. 
and the possible uh, the renewed possibility of marriage. Uh, so that's the world and the story. Now let's talk about the language. Again, the language is closer to modern English, but it's not exactly the same. There are three main differences. The first main difference is that in the 19th century, people like to write using long sentences. The order of the sentences, the grammar is more like modern English. None of that weird sentence order that we see in Paradise Lost. But the sentences are very long. So uh, whenever you hit a period, Judean, or a semicolon, you can pause and think about what you have just read. You don't have to keep going all the way because you will probably get lost. And also these sentences are full of irony. Uh, so like sometimes the surface meaning is not the important thing. The important thing is what the sentence is actually trying to tell you. The second main difference is that Jane Austen uh, uses commas in relative clauses slightly differently. Uh, in, a, in an essential relative clause beginning with that, we say that you should not use a comma. Jane Austen doesn't care. Uh, in her English, the point is not the, uh, how she uses commas, the point is not the grammar, the point is the breathing pattern. Is the sentence too long? Should the reader take a break in the middle? That is how she decides whether to use a comma or not. So you will sometimes read uh, restricting uh, relative clauses beginning with that that also have a comma. Uh, so it's not good grammar according to today's standards, but it is what uh, the way that she wrote. The third difference is that uh, the way that she uses indirect quotation is a bit different. In her day, indirect quotation was not an established practice. She was one of the earliest authors to try this kind of style, direct and indirect quotation. In fact, in English, the novel was born as a, a kind of fake memoir, lu or a fake exchange of letters, Shu Xing Xiao Shuo. So there was no question about quotations. Everything was from one person only. But once we get into more complicated and, and uh, modern kinds of novels, you start to need to tell people what other people said. And so you have the question of quotations. Let me give you an example. This example is not from the novel. This sentence, he said, would you like a cup of tea? In, in uh, Jane Austen's world, or in her language, uh, this might appear as, would she like a cup of tea? So the grammar is indirect quotation, jian jie ying shu. But the punctuation, the sentence structure is direct quotation, zijie ying shu. Does that make sense? So when you come across someone saying that somebody else said something and it doesn't make sense, try to see if ignoring the quotation marks would help it make more sense. So those are just a few tips I have for you about reading Jane Austen. Uh, now, because her sentences are quite long, I also encourage you to take notes as you read. And some of the words she uses are also uh, using an older meaning. Not many, a few of them. Uh, like when we read Paradise Lost, some of the words use meanings that we don't use today, right? They're already obsolete. But in Jane Austen, the older meanings still make sense today. It's just that 
very few people will use that meaning. For example, if you look at the first page, uh, the first page is talking about a book and you see the word leaf. But leaf here does not mean something on a tree. Leaf here means page. Even today, when you talk about the a physical book, each piece of paper is called a leaf. So this is something that people still say today. It's just not very common. That's the kind of old style of vocabulary that Jane Austen uses. If a word really is so old that nobody uses it anymore, uh, there will be a footnote to explain the word. Otherwise, you can probably find uh, a usable definition in a dictionary. Uh, this is also a good reason not to use Google Translate as a dictionary, because Google Translate gives you a definition based on common usage. But in reading Jane Austen, the harder words are precisely not common usage. So it'd be a better idea to check an actual dictionary. OK, that's the introduction to Jane Austen. Do you have questions? Students. OK, so next week movie, next next week uh, before coming to class, please read the first four chapters. Now let's look at the midterm exam. Uh, I'll go over the general rules with you first. These rules apply to the midterm exam and the final exam. First of all, the exam has it, it's a take home online exam. There is a deadline, but there's no timer, which means you don't have to worry about how long you are staring at the Moodle page. You can you you can open Moodle for an entire week. There's no timer as long as you submit your answer before the deadline. You can submit more than one answer and I will only give you the best score. So like let's say you submit an answer and then you go like go grab a snack or take a shower or something and in the middle of your snack or shower you realize ah I forgot to say something. You can go back, start a new answer, add that thing and submit it again and I will only grade the best answer. I will see all of your answers but I will only grade the best one. Three, you must use English because we are the Department of Applied English. If uh, OK, uh, next one. Both exams are open book. You may use any resource except other people, but you can ask me questions. So you can go online, you can go to the library, you can like uh, go to the library and go online. You just cannot talk to anybody else about the exam. But you can talk to me. You can track me down and grab me in the hallway. You can knock on my office door. You can write an email to me. And so far, I have never refused to answer a question about an exam. Uh, back when I was in college, I was taking a very difficult linguistics exam. Re-entry. And uh, we were doing this in the classroom and one of my classmates lost his patience, raised his hand and asked the teacher, Professor, how do you, quest how do, you do question number three? And the professor said, come over here, I'll show you. And so my, my classmate went to the front. The professor quietly explained the question uh, and helped the student finish the question. So uh, if you want to ask me something, don't think it's impossible. Don't think I'll never answer your question. Try, you'll never know. Uh, now, you can use outside resources, but the exam is designed so that you don't have to. If you don't use, if you only look at your notes and the handout, you should be able to give a good answer to the exam. Next one. You don't have to write it directly into Moodle. You can write it somewhere else and then copy and paste it into Moodle. I don't care. Next. In your answer, you must give specific evidence 
from the handouts. So like it, when you, you answer a question, you will have your ideas and then you will have supporting evidence. You have to give evidence from the handout. For each piece of evidence, give me the page number and line numbers unless there's no line number. In parentheses after the evidence, so your answer will probably look like I think blah blah blah. And the first reason is because in the text it says blah blah blah. And then after that, open a parentheses, kai gua hao. Give me the page and or line number and then close parentheses, uh, guan gua hao. The idea is to tell me exactly where you found the information. Now, if you use information from other sources, uh, same rule. Tell me where you found the information. After the information, open a parenthesis. Give me the name of the source, the web address or page number, and then close the parenthesis. Some students uh, will put their sources at the end of their answer. But if you do that, I don't know which piece of information came from which source. So put your sources into your answer. Tell me, oh, I got this from this place. I got that from that place. Does that make sense? OK. Now, this is open book, and you can use outside information as long as you give me a source. So there should be no reason to cheat. But if you do cheat, if you copy without giving a source, that is called plagiarism, Xi, and plagiarism will get you a grade of zero. This exam is worth 40% of your final grade. If you cheat and I catch you, you won't pass the course. So A, there's no reason, and B, it, there's a very heavy penalty. There's no reason to cheat. It's a bad idea. Now, uh, plagiarism is not just about the big ideas. Even the small parts, if you copy from somewhere else and you don't give me a source, are also considered plagiarism. So let's say this is why I recommend you don't have to look at outside sources. It's possible that if you go read a website and it explains something very well, later when you try to use your own words to explain the same idea, you may accidentally use that website's language. That is also cheating. So if you, uh, if I were you, I would first try to answer the questions, and if I have some places I don't understand or I can't explain, then I will go check online or other sources and then put the source along with the information into my answer. That way I can avoid accidentally copying somebody else. Now, uh, what counts as plagiarism? If I can track down where you got the information and you didn't give me a source, that's plagiarism. It could be in English. It could be in Chinese. It could be in Japanese. If I can tell where you found it and you didn't tell me where you found it, that's plagiarism. OK? Don't do it. There's no reason to do it. Uh, and if you have questions about the idea of plagiarism, I found this very interesting article in Chinese that you can read about. OK, those are the general exam rules. Now let's take a look at the actual exam. The exam will begin at the end of this class, and it will go all the way to next Monday before midnight. Oh, yes, so next week we're not watching a movie. Sorry, I forgot. Next week uh, will be a question and answer and self-study session. Uh, because the exam will be ongoing next week, if you have questions about the exam, you can come to class and ask me. Uh, otherwise, you can use that time to study. And then week 11, we're watching the movie. Week 12, uh, before week 12, please read the first four chapters of the book. Here's the exam. Answer one of the following. If you answer 
More than one, I will only count the best answer. Question one. Compared to everything else that happens in Tis Pity She's a Whore, do you think the incest, Tongjian, uh, Luan Luan, is relatively positive or negative, and why? For this question, you must choose either positive or negative. You cannot say it depends. You cannot say it's in the middle. You have to say that it's relatively positive or relatively negative. Uh, how can you get a good score on this question? The best answer will discuss the good and bad aspects of the incest and compare them with the good and bad aspects of at least two other significant plot points. So two other important things that happen in the play. Then you weigh the good and the bad, and choose the most appropriate answer, whether the incest is more positive or more negative. Do you want to ask me about this question? Uh, in our class discussions, some students have said, you know, like even though a brother is not supposed to love his sister, uh, it's kind of romantic. So it's not entirely negative. There may be some positive aspects. That's what this question is asking. Question two. Do you think the doctrine of original sin as presented in Paradise Lost makes sense? Why or why not? Again, you must choose either yes or no. You can't say, I'm not sure. You can't say it depends. You have to say it does or does not make sense. Now, a good answer will examine the causes, effects, and absolution, sermian, of original sin. So not just the question of why do Adam's children have to suffer, but also the causes, so in other words, Satan, all of that, and the end of original sin. How does original sin end? And so that's Jesus and all of that. The entire thing. If at least one of these doesn't make sense, then your answer should be no. But you should still discuss every part. So for example, if you say that the cause of original sin, uh, like Satan fighting God and then seducing Eve, blah, blah, blah. If you think that part does not make sense, your answer will be no, but you should still discuss the effects passing down generation after generation and the ending. Jesus comes and, and bears our sins for us. You have to give a complete answer. Now, uh, that's a good answer. The best answer will begin all the way at the beginning, not just seducing Eve, but why Satan is rebelling against God. So it looks like it's only asking about original sin, but in fact, this question is asking you about the entire poem. Questions? So choose one of these to answer. Um, if your answer does not have specific evidence, you will only get 50%, which is 20 points. If your answer, uh, if you if you do not answer the question, right? You talk about the play or the poem, and but you don't answer the question, you will only get twenty points. Uh, so you must answer the question and give me at least one piece of specific evidence in order to get a passing grade. And then, like the more complete your answer is, the higher your grade is. Possible grades. Uh, move by four points. So passing grade is 24 points, 60%. Then you have 28 points, 70%. 32 points, 80%. 36 points, 90%. And then 40 points, 100%. Those are your possible grades. Of course, if you answer in Chinese, I will also have to keep taking away points. So like passing grade is 24 points. If you don't give me evidence, I take away four points to 20 points, 50%. If you don't answer the question, I take away four points, 16 
points, uh, 40%. If you use Chinese, I, you will get 12 points, 30%. Right, so it goes up and down by four points. And that is the exam. Do you have questions you want to ask me now? Oh, I should tell you, uh, the answer space is very big. You don't have to fill the space. I made it very big to encourage you to give a more complete answer. Even if you fill this space, the box will just keep on going. It's an infinite space, kongjian. So don't worry about filling the box. Uh, students online, do you want to ask me about the exam? No. Great. OK, so uh, the rest of this class, you can begin thinking about these questions. Uh, you have a little more than a week to finish the exam. And um, if you get stuck in the middle, you can always come and ask me questions next week.